Hi there, this is Photography of Director Podcast, and my name is Vitaly Boxer. I'm a cinematographer, and I work on all sorts of different projects, and I've decided to do a podcast about other filmmakers. Today we interview John Michael Scholl, and what's interesting about this filmmaker is that he basically dropped everything one summer after school to head on to LA. He jumps in his 66 Mustang, which is a nice car, of course, with 500 bucks in his pocket, and he ends up on the beach at Santa Monica Beach, basically homeless. And uh, yes, he was homeless for that week because uh, he figured he can just use the showers at a public beach and live in his car until he figured out the rest of his life. So <laughs> there's a good story there in the middle of this podcast you guys should stick around for. And uh, he, right now he does a lot of stuff. He's, um, he's a story producer. He worked on a show that we both shot called The Hunt with John Walsh and uh, a lot of other stuff. And don't forget, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes with a video or audio only feed. Just look up Photography of Director. And all the links to the films we chat about can be found on photographyofdirector.com. Please enjoy the show. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> okay. Shut up. I'm talking. <laughs> okay, go, go, go. Welcome to Photography of Director. Uh, who knows what episode this is? I don't keep track, but it's probably like in the four or five or six range. <laughs> and uh, on our on our show today, we have uh, John Scholl, John Michael Scholl. So when you look him up on IMDb, you're not confused with the other 20,000 John Scholls. How's it going? It's going well. This is the sound of my voice. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's nice. It soothes me. So I actually know you from working uh, a lot on a bunch of TV stuff we did for... Nat Geo, and uh, we also shot The Hunt with John Walsh, which is John Walsh's comeback for from America's Most Wanted, etc. And yeah, you've been CNN. Say it again? CNN, right? CNN. So you've been working, obviously, for a long time as a sort of story producer. Is that the correct term? Yes. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the PC version or the non-PC version? Well, give it, <laughs> my listeners want the truth. The truth. I think it's, well, I mean, it's... it's uh, uh, there's a lot of, I mean, I think once upon a time when reality TV was new, everybody thought that it was, it was documentary. You were just filming these people doing these crazy things. And now, you know, with all sorts of shows like the Kardashians and all that kind of thing, I think people are sophisticated enough. Average viewers are sophisticated enough to know that it's constructed, it's written. You know, the scenarios are, are pre-planned and then, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's written. It's just straight up written. Um, so, so, uh, but you they don't want to, you know, they don't want to say that you're writing because I think then, you know, there are all sorts of issues in terms of, you know, WGA and all that kind of thing. So I think originally, I, th I, I, I'm, I don't know, I could be wrong, but that seems to me to be the genesis of the term story producer. So you're producing story. Basically right. You're, you also write the script. I mean, we go out and shoot documentary, quote unquote, documentary things, but it's all pre-written sort of documentary things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the the exception to that is a show like The Hunt where you're telling a real story. I mean, and we, you know, as you know from working on that show, it was a it was a a goal of ours to be really honest and really tell these people's stories um and still make the, them compelling. So so then it was less about writing copy than it was doing all sorts of pre-interviews and then you would select sort of the pieces from this sort of long long story that you would then sort of compress down into an hour or half hour so that you could, you know, have an arc and actually have it be dramatic and still keep people's attention and not, and not misrepresent, you know, what happened. So uh, just to be more concrete, give us an example. So obviously I come in only to shoot the episode and I could give a shit about your, your story arc, <laughs> but <laughs> that's not true. I actually care, but <laughs> I just wanted to say it. So, but I come in at a point where it's already re ready for me. It's not like I have to go searching for, let's figure this out, obviously. We, we figure out the shots, we figure out the content in terms of when we're, when we're at location, but how long do you spend and how many people are involved to actually get all these interviews, you know, and, and get, uh, because you're interviewing a lot of people to get the story, like on, on The Hunt, for example, and uh, how many people are involved, who's helping you, uh, you know, things like that. Tell us about the intricate working of that. Well, the hunt. Um, so there was a team of researchers. I think there were two or three researchers that were start that started before any of the producers sort of came on board, and they would just go through LexisNexis. You know, they would go through news articles. They would talk to their contacts with the U.S. Marshals or the FBI, and they would, you know, 
try to find really compelling stories that would fit within sort of the theme of the show. And they would get all that groundwork taken care of. And then once there were, and then they would submit all of those potential stories to the network. And the network would say, this one's good. This one will work if we can have this person and this person on board. You know, they, they sort of have their, their ranking, their choices. Um, so then when we have those stories sort of set, <clears throat> then, then they would bring me on and they would bring, you know, a handful of other producers and they would divvy up those stories sort of amongst us. And then we would sort of take over from that point. We'd get all the contact information and, the, you know, the, the basic outlines of the stories from these researchers. And we would contact all these people. And, you know, your first goal is to – well, your first goal is to work on a show where you know they're not going to take advantage of people, you know. So The Hunt is, it was a good show that way because we weren't trying to tell a story or, or that was not true or sort of make a story more dramatic than it really was. These were really – compelling stories to begin with um so i'm gonna actually show you know before we go further about it uh, i'm gonna show an actual trailer of the hunt and then we're gonna go back to your history but i just wanted to start there because this was more current that we worked on roll the clip i'm gonna roll the clip baby hold on a sec on the series premiere of the hunt you never know when a person can snap she said i'm really afraid that he is going to kill us what the hell kind of a man is that that shoots his own little girl? He can kill his own family. He can kill anybody. Shane Miller is a narcissistic, sociopathic coward. Anybody that gets in his way is not safe. The Hunt with John Walsh. Series premieres Sunday night at 9 on CNN. Okay, whoa, well, dramatic. Ooh, that was good. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what we worked on. That was actually a clip from uh, season one. Uh, I think they're now in season two, and, and they'll probably have ten more seasons because John Walsh is the king of, of finding criminals. Is that correct? He's a machine. He is a machine. So so as a story producer, what, so when you got it, I know the, scene, the network did it. Uh, obviously, the production company got it. But then when you got it, how long did you take on the story after it was already sort of vetted? Well, I mean, you would really you, – you have sort of a – a, a window, right? This is how many weeks we have before, but you know, the schedule deems that we have to start shooting. Otherwise we're not going to have enough money to sort of complete the season. So, you know, there isn't a set sort of like you have to have this many people on board in this many days, but really it's like, we need to start shooting by this date, which is, you know, right. two or three weeks away and you need to have enough groundwork done so that by the time we get the crew together and we go out in the field, everything is lined up. So, I would handle all of that. I would call all of the people who were involved in that particular story. And then it's my job to really sort of, con you know, convince them that we're going to tell their story in an honest way. And with The Hunt, you know, that was, a, that was a show about catching fugitives who were still at large. So the people who were affected by these, the things that these um, alleged criminals did, um, you know, they had an incentive to speak with us because they wanted these people caught as well. So... And it helped having John Walsh. I mean, you know, when you say his name, people automatically connect with that and they know, you know, what his deal is, which is catching these guys. So, Well, who is John Walsh for the, for the younger listeners? America's Most Wanted. He's the, <laughs> the man behind America's Most Wanted, which ran for, what, 15 years or something like that? Right. Some of our listeners are seven, <laughs> between the <laughs> ages of seven and 15. It's a hot demo. <laughs> <laughs> it's the demo I'm trying to reach. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, well... Uh, I wanted to start there, but, you know, this is where you are now. You're story producing on these types of TV shows, right? Yep. Uh, and what was your current one? Just, uh, just to give us a brief uh, about um, it. It's uh, Wrestling with Death on WGN. It's their first reality show. Okay. So you, you bounce between sort of documentary reality. Is that correct right now? Yeah. And uh, are you satisfied as a human being? Never. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> No. So now that we've got that out of the way, we've crushed our guests today. Yeah. <laughs> Dreams have been destroyed. Well, we're both we're both doing it, obviously, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, I do want to talk about let's let's talk about this now because uh, reality has its problems, right? Documentary reality that we feel, at least I, I'm going to say, talk. I'm going to talk for us. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes there's not enough support. You know what I mean? That it, it's it's not the same as when you go on a feature film and you have like thirty. 30 crew members, 40 crew members, you have a gaffer, a grip, a sound guy, blah, 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 blah. Tell us how a reality shoot mostly works most of the time or a documentary. Well, I mean, you know, reality shows, 
I would. I mean, I would argue that any, even if you're working on a feature with you know 30 people, 100 people, 500 people, there's going to be there are going to be people who feel like there's not enough support. But it's it's a much different thing. I mean, it's you know when you're working in television, how much support you have and how much time you have to put together a project that's well made and well crafted and you know is still entertaining is directly connected to how many people are watching, what the viewership is. So on a show like The Bachelor, you know, there's a, there's a lot of money and there's a huge crew and there's a bunch of cameras and there are really competent people that have it together because, you know, that's a show that's gone on for season after season after season and, you know, they bring back, you know, people that they like who are, who are really talented. So well, what, what was, because you did work on The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, right? On The yeah, Bachelorette. Yeah. So, uh. I mean, tell us, so how big is a crew on the ba- something that big? Because that's a big ABC show, right? Was that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, that crew was huge. I mean, when you're, t- when you're talking like, you know, the first night where uh, The Bachelorette has, you know, 20 guys who show up and or 30 guys or however many it is, um, it's a huge crew because there's a million things happening and it's almost like, it's almost like an improv show. You have an outline for what you want to do. You know that at this time we're going to, you know, start pulling people away to do, you know, interviews. And you know that at some at some point in the evening, you know, you want to get these guys some one on one time with the Bachelorette, you know. So you, you have things evolve as the evening progresses and you just have to be nimble. You have to be able to roll with it and and make decisions on the fly. And that show, I mean, by the time I hopped on it, it was it's a well oiled machine. I mean, what, what did you do on it exactly? I was a segment producer. Now, how is that different from a story producer? Well, a story producer is generally in post. So a story producer is sort of, is usually, you know, something's already been shot in the field and the footage well, has been sent back to the office. And but, the story but, but, hold producer, on, hold on. Weren't you story producer on The Hunt and you were there uh, with me shooting it? You were there producing the what, episode? I, I, don't, I don't know if I, I think I, my title on that might have just been producer. You don't even know your title. They didn't tell you. <laughs> it's all, they all blend together. <laughs> right. It, well, it's becoming a little fuzzy, right? It's a little bit... It's like, you do everything. Right? Well, I, yeah, I feel like when, you know, when there's not as much money, it's like, hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do that? And, and if it's right. a show, you know, a show like The Hunt, where, you know, you and I wanted it, you know, you, we're sitting there and we're talking to these people who have gone through these oh, yeah. crazy events... No, these people are severely damaged people, and they've been through some serious shit. So if someone hasn't seen it, they should watch it just to see how serious this stuff is. Yeah, and so you feel, you know, if you're not a complete sociopath, you feel you feel a responsibility right. to tell the story in the best way that you can with the right. tools that you have available. So, you know, they, I, 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 know be- I know you're saying that, but a part of me, when I'm in those serious moments, I have to shut down my emotional brain because there's no way I can... Just focus, because if you're just listening to them, you're just going to cry. You know what I mean? You have to watch the lighting, the sounds, like, it's like you just have to make sure everything is technically correct to tell that story, and then I let you do the crying. That's, that was the... Well, I feel, I sort of felt like, I mean, you, you were there with me doing the last, the very last interviews for season one, and like, I I feel like at that point, you, you almost sort of become a little bit like a robot. You're, you're absorbing this information and and these emotions in the story and you're watching these people tell really really painful you know sort of moments that they've lived through and there's your brain is almost separated into you know two sides one is sort of crafting like okay so I'll be able to use that to 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 sort of explain what happened and I need this person to explain it to me in a specific way and if you don't get it just right you have to ask them to do it again which can be really you know sort of awkward um, that is I really awkward. Like someone uh, make you know scratches their mic while they're almost yeah. in tears, and then you're well, like we're talking about <laughs> like their child that's just been you know that was kidnapped and hasn't been found, you know, and you're right. and and they're they're sort of like eyes are welling up and they scratch their mic, you know. You <laughs> sit there and you let them finish that bit, and then you and your mind are thinking like, okay, this is going to be awkward, but I just have to do it. Can you? Tell me that just one more time. Yeah, that was really fantastic. Um, I just want to make sure we have it in a usable you know, way, and I, I need you not to, to touch your mic. So just give me that one more time. Right. So you as a producer, that's what I'm saying. You weren't just a story producer in your, the way you were defining it. You were producing as well the, those episodes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm you, sort of, you molded the story, right? And you also went in and were on production producing it. Yep. Right. Yeah. So, uh, 
So yeah, get that credit. Take that credit in IMDb. <laughs> So, but yeah. I wanted to show you the difference. Like on Bachelorette, I'm sure you had this giant, massive crew because that's a big ABC show. The Hunt, even though that's a reasonable size, I mean, it's a semi-success now, I think, right, for CNN. Yeah, I think so. But less people are shooting it, like on a day-to-day basis. It's, uh, it's oh, like, oh yeah, much less. I mean, the, the the audiences are different. I feel like on a show like The Hunt, there maybe is a smaller audience than obviously than The Bachelorette, but the people who are into it are also really, really, really into it, you know? Right. Um, and, and which show did you prefer doing, actually, going from that giant Bachelorette show, which you had a lot of money, I'm sure. You had, you had caviar on set, right? To <laughs> well, I mean, The Bachelorette was, like, a unique experience. I don't know if you can compare working on a show like that to working on anything else aside from maybe, like, Amazing Race or something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were flying all around the world, you know, and that show is all about sort of fantasy fulfillment, you know, so the places we were staying at, the places we were visiting, they're all just sort of fairy tale beautiful. So it's like, oh, we're going to fly to Madrid, we're going to go to Sevilla, we're going to go to Barcelona, then we're going to, you know, take a helicopter, we're going to go to Hawaii and take a helicopter into the jungles on the big island. And, you know, that does sound like fun. (laughs) Sweet. You know, it's pretty great. (laughs) Right. So uh, go ahead, you're flying all around in a helicopter. Yeah. So that was, I mean, that just in terms of fun, that was fun. You know, it was like, right. oh, I have some errands to do while I'm here on the big island. I need to rent a car. I'll rent a Jeep, drive around with the top down running errands in Hawaii. I mean, you can't you can't complain about that. So that experience was great. The, and, the, and the people were really great on that show, too. It was, you know, what happened to that show? Well, why why aren't you no longer on it? I came. Uh, oh, well, I then I, I worked on some of my own projects, you know, my uh a buddy of mine, a producing partner of mine and a good friend, we wanted to do pitch our own shows, you know, so we... Did you I leave? Took, Did you leave that show, The Bachelorette? Well, it, it was over. You know, the season was over and then I started doing my own stuff. And they alternate. So it's like half the year they're doing The Bachelorette and then they're doing The Bachelor and they had a couple shows in between. So, and I was a new guy. There are people who have worked on that show for, you know, right, 10 right, years, right. you know, ten. so, Got I it. mean large crews people that have been there for a long long time so let's go back uh let's go back in your history because now now we know what you do you're a story producer producer slash producer um let's go back when you started you're from a small town (laughs) 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 you're from a small town from bumfuck i don't know but tell us (laughs) from ohio or is that correct i was i was actually born in la I, then, I, by the way, I'm from a small town in Babrusk, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah. they're all small towns. But we're Babrusk. all now uh, Babrusk. That's in Minsk in Belarusia. So for those mm-hmm. listeners who don't know, you're listening to not a naturalized American. <laughs> 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 but uh, yes, I have my uh, my passport, so don't kick me you're, out. You're yet. totally legal. <laughs> I'm totally illegal right now. <laughs> Thanks to my parents. Yeah. Okay, so now that we've covered that, uh, you were, you're from a small town. Where did you grow up, and how did you get into you know wanting to do this? Well, so I was born in L.A., and uh, when I was really, really little, my mom worked at Fox. She worked right on the lot. Um, so when I, I had like these really sort of early childhood memories of like my mom taking me to the Fox lot and you know seeing like Lee Majors from The Fall Guy and seeing like the Mash set and you know, seeing like movie stars walking around the lot. And I I just thought it was like better than Disneyland. You know, it was, it was so cool. So so this is what, this was in LA. This was in LA. I was, yeah, I was born at UCLA. So I lived like, uh, you know, on the West side when I was really young. All right. So you're Um, born in a big town. (laughs) Well, then when I was 10, we moved to Hilliard, Ohio. So, which is like a suburb of Columbus. And I think now it's bigger than it was then. But when I was a kid and I moved there, there were, it was, there were a lot of cornfields, like we moved, we we moved into a house on a, on a road called Cemetery Road. I was miserable at first. I just thought, this is this is the worst. Like I've just left California and we've come to Hilliard, Ohio, and I live on Cemetery Road. <laughs> you know, I had never seen snow when we moved there in the middle of December, and it was a blizzard. I just thought I was being tortured. Right. You're like, this is where I'm going to die <laughs> by twelve. <Yeah. laughs> My parents turned off cable because like I didn't want to go out. I just wanted to like watch. You know. Nickelodeon all day. I didn't want. I was just like depressed. <laughs> oh man, a ten-year-old in a serious state of depression. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, at what point did you went back? Right. So, uh, what happened 
what, what made you want to go back to LA to pursue initially acting, I think, right? It wasn't even to being a well, producer. I, I just wanted to work in film and television. I wanted to make Oh, since 10, television. since or whenever, since a kid, since eight. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to work. I, were, I wanted to work on the Fox lot where my mom worked. I always thought that was just the coolest place in the world. And so even, you know, through like junior high and high school, it was like whenever I was working on a project where they would let you sort of like one of those open ended projects, like you can you know, give a speech in front of class or you can do a movie or you can do whatever. I would always get my friends together and we would make movies. We had, my parents had one of those big cheesy VHS camcorders. We'd actually load the VHS cassette. I had one. <laughs> yeah. So we'd make movies and then I would connect that to the VCR and edit, you know. You basically were VCR doing what I was doing, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Two VCRs you needed for editing. Yeah. But you could use the camera as a VCR. Oh, look at you, advanced. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was top of the line RCA right there. <laughs> well, that's 320 by 240, all right? That's, uh, yeah. that's the highest well, res we had back then. <laughs> yeah, and when you looked at the viewfinder, it was black and white. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I was doing that kind of stuff in high school, and then I was doing plays and, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So... When it, when it came time to graduate, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I originally was going to be pre-med. And I went and did a bunch of college visits. And, uh, but I didn't. I just sort of picked pre-med because I, I thought, you know, I, I was good at chemistry. And I was like, oh, I could do that. I also had, like, broken bones doing BMX riding and, you know, rollerblading and skating and stuff. And I, so I had seen my own bones. And I, and I didn't have a fear of, like, that kind of stuff. So I thought, like, I can do pre-med. And then, but before I even decided what college I wanted to go to, I sort of had one of those moments where I was like, let's just, let's just go for it. Let's go crazy. And um, I, I, I wanted to go to, like, USC, but that was so expensive. And I didn't know anybody, you know, out there. So I, and my parents were like, no, we're not, we don't have the money to pay for that. Um, and I had gotten into some schools, you know, I'd gotten into, like, Ohio State and, you know, some other like smaller schools that were close by that we could like afford um, and not really have an issue that way. So I just decided, oh, what the hell? There was a small school in Evansville, Indiana, University of Evansville, that had a really, really amazing theater program. And I thought, I'll audition. You know, there was a there was some people that I knew that had auditioned there, um, and I I really had zero pressure. I had I had like an audition where you really. I didn't think I was going to get accepted. It was more just like, oh, I can take an eight-hour road trip by myself. I'm 18. I'll go down there. They're going to put me up for the weekend. I'll audition, and then I'll drive home. It'll be fun. And I got accepted, and so I, I went there to study theater. And, um, you know, it was a great program. Wait, how long did people. you stay? You didn't stay there long, right? Uh, I went, well, I went for two years. My, my freshman year, um, I was actually, like, you know, into it, and I was – sort of actively participating as, as what you would expect one to do who's in college. But, um, the summer after my freshman year in college, I decided I wanted to go to LA for the summer. So I packed up my car and I just drove cross country. And did you uh, tell your parents? Like, I did. <laughs> well, I think my parents thought I was bluffing, you know, cause I said I was going to go and right. I'm out of here. <laughs> they were like, okay. And I had a, like a 66 uh, Mustang and this was before, GPS. I didn't have a debt. There was no debit cards. You know, I had like, it was all the wrong things you could do. Like I, I had like an envelope full of cash, you know, <laughs> how much, how much, how much cash did you have on you? I think I had like 500 bucks or 600 bucks. I mean, right. like you thought you were rich. <laughs> I, I, well, I thought I have enough to get me there. Right. And I won't starve and I can put gas in the car and then I'll, I just, I was like, I'll figure it out when I get there. That's you know, pretty, I really uh, that's, had zero that's pretty crazy. Yeah idea what I was going to do. But I, I just thought, when else am I going to get a chance to do this, you know, with not, hopefully not severe consequences. Right. So, I mean, now you have a dog, right? You can't just do that. Oh, I have two, yeah. <laughs> I have two dogs and they, and they rule my life. <laughs> right. You can't just get in the car and drive. <laughs> yeah. So, so you get to, you get to LA, you're now 20. Is that right? Am I no, counting I was, it right? Um, I was like 19. Okay. 19. You get yeah. to LA, you're broke. You're in your you're in your nice car though. Nice car, and I, I uh and I would call my parents from the payphone at the Santa Monica Pier just to let them know it was like proof of life. Don't worry, I'm still alive. Right. 
Don't um, worry, I'm living I, on the beach. <laughs> I parked my car at Venice Beach because they had showers there, and I thought, well, I, so I'll be able to get up really early, <laughs> take a shower, and not be a filthy pig, and then I'll drive around and look for work, you know, during the day. And uh, so I did that for for a little while. And wait, then, wait, 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 hold on. So you were homeless? Is this what you're getting to? <laughs> I had a '66 Mustang. <laughs> That's not a home, my friend. <laughs> So you were living in your car? Yeah. You you really did the LA actor thing. That's like that's like the classic movie thing that yeah. I've seen since I was a boy. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. I right. I also like, you know, listen, I moved away from California when I was 10, so and I missed it. I mean, I I grew to love certain things about Ohio, but like I I always wanted to move back to California. Right. Um right. so for me it was like this is going to be a sweet adventure, and worst case, I'm in California. Right. So, okay, that's, that's uh, brave. So tell us more. So then I'm running out of money, and I am. I call my mom, you know, just to check in, and she says, "Oh well, you know, you should uh, look up your aunt Viv." So there's a there's this woman who. Um, she uh, wait. So a, hold on. She she told you this. How long were you already there in your homeless in your car <laughs> until she gives you some uh, advice? Probably about like a week. You know. <laughs> Uh, she's like, let him suffer for a week. Then I'll then I'll help him out. <laughs> well, she didn't really know what I was doing. You know, it was every time I called to check in, I was like, oh, everything's great. Yeah, you everything's know. great on the beach. I'm showering. <laughs> yeah, I'm I have clean. no soap. <laughs> my teeth are brushed. <laughs> I can't afford the toothpaste, but my teeth are brushed. Yeah, serious. <laughs> okay, um, so she she tells you about Aunt Viv, and uh, tell yeah. us, Aunt Viv is like a hooked up lady, huh? She's a family friend. Um, she's actually my my aunt's mother, but I always just grew up calling her Aunt Viv, and she worked in in movies and and in television for decades. Uh, she was a hairstylist. Um, she's now retired, but uh, she lived in Culver City, and my mom gave me her address and said, "Yeah, you should go say hi to her because maybe she she works in Hollywood. Maybe she can you know help you find." work or something. So I just showed up on this poor lady's doorstep. She hadn't seen me, I think, since I was like seven years old, you know, and here I am, you know, knocking on her door. Oh, you didn't even call. You just no. came straight to her house. No cell phones, you know. Oh, those pay phones. Yeah, but I just sort of figured I'm, I'm at the beach and she's in Culver <laughs> City. I'll just drive over. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I went over and, and she was extraordinarily kind and said like, yeah, yeah, come in. Oh my gosh. How's your mom? Um, come in. You smell, take a shower. <laughs> I was clean. There were showers at the beach. <laughs> <sighs> That's funny. Um, and so anyway, she, I just said, Hey, you know, I'm here for the summer. Um, I'm trying to find work. And she was working on a movie at that time and on the Warner brothers lot in Burbank and said, well, you know, I can get you on the lot for a day if you want to come and, you know, see how a, a movie set works. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, that's amazing. Let's do it. So she took me to the, uh, she got me on the lot and I was in the hair trailer. I got to see all the actors getting their makeup, you know, and hair done, you know, before the shoot. And then, um, I ended up sort of like basically getting onto a soundstage when I wasn't supposed to be there, but, you know, sort of sneaking in and just Trying to observe, really, honestly, just trying to observe because I wanted to see as much as I could, and um, and I, then I, you know, got I got noticed and was given a basically given a job. Wait, 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 hold on, you skip. You snuck onto a soundstage, and I was given a job. <laughs> was this the nineteen forties? <laughs> usually, yeah. you get, usually you get kicked out of the fucking soundstage. What do you mean you? <laughs> I got to do a Marco Rubio. Yeah. So, I, I, what do you mean you you snuck in? And you're just looking, and then what happened? Well, then... Um, Can you go into it, or is that like a legal thing? <laughs> I can't. Well, yeah, I can't. I got, I, I got noticed by Kevin Spacey, who... Oh, so you wanted to skip I, that? You wanted to skip Kevin Spacey? No, no. <laughs> I, so he noticed, it, he noticed me and was like, what are you doing? You're not on the crew. And I explained, and then... That's how good I, Kevin Spacey is. He knows every fucking motherfucker on the crew. I guess. <laughs> right. And then, uh, uh, so basically, I, w I was, went from being sort of terrified that I was going to get, you know, right. in big trouble and was going to get, you know, uh, my infant fired to... What movie did you sneak trigger. onto? What movie did, what, you, what movie did you sneak onto? Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Okay. Clint Eastwood was directing. Um, and, and 
Kevin basically said, "You can. I'll I'll set it up so you can come back as many times as you want this week. You can watch. Don't touch anything. Don't talk to anybody. Just stay out of the way, and you can observe." And so I did that, and then it was. Um, this isn't that cool. Like he's like, ah, oh, this kid's got gumption. Let me help him out. Yeah, he was totally cool. It was <laughs> it was one of those ridiculous sort of like. Oh, this is what happens. Like you come here and you get a job, you know, or you get <laughs> you just yeah. show up, right? <laughs> so it was that first weekend and I was uh talking to a girl that I was dating from college and on my Anviv's phone and there was a beep, there was a, you know, call waiting and I didn't know who it was and I clicked over and it was Kevin and he said, "Hey, are you still looking for work out here?" and I said, "Yeah." And he said, um, do you know Ian McKellen? And I said, well, I've heard of him. <laughs> Kevin Spacey. Him. Oh, hold on. Kevin Spacey. How did he, how did he have your number? He, he took your number and he called he you. Knew, he knew I was staying with, with, uh, Vivian for the summer. Okay. He I, knew, he knew Vivian. So this is yeah, not yeah. just, uh, she was like the lead hairstylist for right. the movie. Right. So that, that's why he didn't get kicked out. It wasn't just, <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, no. It wasn't just like a rando <laughs> off the street who commandoed into the, into the set. <laughs> He's yeah. Like, All right. I'll let you stay kid. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to kick you out and ruin your life. So, um, but anyway, he called and said that he had spoken with Ian McKellen and Ian needed an assistant, uh, for the summer and wanted to know if I was interested. And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, well, here's his phone number. He's expecting your call. So I said, thanks. And I clicked over and told the the girl I was dating, Hey, I got to go. I got to call Ian McKellen. (laughs) And then, uh, I just got off the phone with Kevin Spacey. Now I got to call Ian McKellen. (laughs) Yeah, I think her response is "fuck you." you know? <laughs> yeah, you fucking liar. Who's on the? Who are you yeah. fucking? <laughs> yeah, that's bullshit. So um, oh, that's what I so would think immediately. <laughs> I called Ian. He said, "Come over," and he was staying like up in the Hollywood Hills. And he said, "You know, come, come, come straight round." You know, so right. I told him I would. Keep in mind, like, you know, I hadn't been in LA for that long, and I'd mainly been staying like near the West Side, and there, this was before. Like Google Maps, so <laughs> this I is before no technology existed. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea how to get to the Hollywood Hills. Right, right. From Culver City, so it ended up taking me like two hours to get there. And when I finally got to his house, I had to go stop at a grocery store and buy this thing called a Thomas Guide, which is basically like a you know a big, map book. thick spiral a map book. notebook with maps. Yeah. And I found my way there. For all my seven-year-old talking. listeners, we used yeah. to have a paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had we had it's, diagrams it's of the rock. way the world was. <laughs> it's a rock with words chiseled into it. Um, uh, so I get to Ian's house, and there's a note on the door that said, "I thought you were going to come straight over. I had errands to run. Sorry, we couldn't talk." And I thought, "Holy shit! I've just blown it." You know, like right? You missed. You missed. This is how this story's going to end. You know, like I'm going to lose it. That's so it. I, uh, I just sat on his front porch like a, <laughs> like a dog, you know. Like I, just, I sat on his front porch and was like, I'm just gonna wait for him to get back because uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna go back to my Aunt Viv's house with my tail between my legs. Right, like, right. you know, if he comes back and sees me and says no thanks, then fine. Right. I'm gonna I'm wait for Ian McKellen. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I, I said okay. If it gets dark, if the sun's starting <laughs> to go down, then I'll leave because I can't be the creeper. Like sitting on his doorstep in the dark, you right, know. Right, right, right. But if it's still sunlight, I'm gonna stay. So I stayed there for like four hours, and uh, no cell phone to keep me occupied. <laughs> nothing. I was just I had a book. You had I'm your like, map book with you. <laughs> reading an actual book. And wait, wait. Oh, you had a real walked, book. You had a book though. I, I yeah, I had a book. Okay, my life okay. was still mostly in the car. No, no, that's good. That's good. You had a book because I, you know, it's without a cell phone. Who knows what the fuck we do for four hours, right? Yeah. So he, he finally comes home and he's sort of looks at me and I said, hi, Ian, you know, John Michael, I, you know, I talked to Kevin. He told me to come over and then we spoke and he was like, oh, oh, OK. Oh, All right, you're we'll creepy. <laughs> yeah. So we went in, we talked for like five minutes and then he was like, OK, well, um, I need this done and I need that done. He starts listing off all these things, and I immediately am like, "Am I supposed to be remembering this? Is this? <laughs> am I hired? Is this? What? You know? I thought we were just talking." And then he was like, "Do you have a pen and paper?" I said, "No." And he was like, "Always have a pen and paper." Yes, sir. You know. And he grabbed a pen and paper and just started giving me errands to run. Um, well, what, what, so, so, yeah. what was the first errand that Ian McKellen made you 
Right. I Dang. think he wanted me to pick up his dry cleaning or something. You know, it was like I had dry cleaning, groceries, and then he just standard uh, stuff. It wasn't anything kinky. No, no. <laughs> right. he was legit. He's prefer- he's a pro. <laughs> he's a pro, right? He's not yeah, like go get the KY. <laughs> yeah, yeah. None of that. All right. It no. was good, clean errands. He wa- he wanted me to talk. He I, if he needed to communicate with his agent, mm-hmm. I I had to call his agent because he didn't want to talk to his agent. <laughs> Which was ridiculous because it's like his agent is probably like, who the fuck is this 20-year-old, you know? Who the fuck are you? 20-year-old kid calling me, you know? Like he yeah. was just so disdainful. Like, what? Who are you? Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Click. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but he was working on Gods and Monsters. Ian was. Um, so then once once so that you started, started to happened. go to set right you started to go, go oh, I was on the... set every day I right. was on set every day I was running lines with Ian in between takes oh shit you were rehearsing it. with Ian yeah oh geez yeah That's I, need, cool. I need to run my lines can you you know come run lines it was amazing it was a dream you know so I was, yeah, what the fuck? I was running lines with him and he was he was and he knew that I was studying theater at Evansville so he was all about it he he thought he was giving me you know a cool experience. He was like, "Oh, he, you know, I'll let this kid run lines with me." So we did right. that the whole movie, um, and it was amazing. I just was like, "This is this is the greatest place ever." I mean, it was so cool. <laughs> the set was amazing. Everybody on it was great. Um, and then when the movie was done, you know, he, I helped him like ship a bunch of stuff back to England and get everything wrapped up. And then he he left, and I wanted to stay in L.A. but. I our, my student loan stuff had already gone through, and I basically had to go back my second year, and I, I really wanted to stay, but I couldn't get my money back. So I basically spent my second year, just sort of watching the countdown clock. And right. Waiting, so, waiting. so so you were you were like heading up in the world really fast. You end up you're broke, you're 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 living on the street in a car. You're taking showers on the street. You make it sound way more sinister than it does. Uh, well, you, you know, if you're living in a car and you're taking showers on the street, you're, it's, it's homelessness. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe you had a nice car, but it wasn't a Datsun, right? So it wasn't... Yeah, yeah. But that's homelessness. You know, you had your parents figured, to fall back I on. I figured something out. If I would have called my parents and said, well, like... Well, so, so how long till uh, it was like a week till you actually had Vivian's house to stay at, yep, right? Yeah, yeah. And then basically you're working with Ian and you're, you're, you're hanging out with the rich and famous. You're working with Ian and then you decide to go back to Ohio. Is well, this, I, this... I, my student loan stuff had already gone through. So, right. And I couldn't get my, that money back. So, so, so I said, went back. Fuck it. I sh- well, yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I totally should. So I you... ended up going, going back. And then when the school year was over, I came back to LA. And wait, 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 hold on. You went back for the third year now, right? Cause you were yeah. there two years. No, no. At the that was the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. Oh, I see. So this and is your I second back, year. I went back for my second year after that, and just sort of like, got it. Was in was not you know present. I was just waiting for to get back to L.A. Right, right. And right. then and then but then once I came back to L.A. the second time, it was like starting from scratch. It was you know. Were you back on the street in your car? <laughs> no, no, no. I had, I met somebody, uh, an actor who had a small role in that movie and we became friends and had kept in touch. And then, and then when I was going to come back to LA, I got in touch with him and said, do you know anyone that needs a roommate? And he said, Oh, I could use a roommate. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you know, it was one of those situations, like four guys living in a house, you know, but you still had no job, right? No, not, not, not when I first got out there. I had, I had some money that I'd saved up again during the year. Um, and I ended up when I got to LA, I sold my car I sold the Mustang smart and bought a cheap car. And, uh, so then I had like, you know, thousands of dollars, which to me at the time was (laughs) a fortune. Right. And rent was, uh, rent was a few hundred bucks, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, and then I, and then it was like, Oh, I'm here. Let's make movies. Let's write stuff. Let's, you know, have some fun. And I, I did all sorts of odd jobs. I was like a temp. I worked, you know, I worked at like Cedar Sinai and accounts payable you know, and did ridiculous stuff. I, I was, I was doing everything. I was, you know, at this point, uh, you know, cause we started off the show, like you're a story producer. Now you're a producer, obviously on shows at this point, you weren't trying to be a producer in the, in the background. You were actually trying to be an actor for the most part, besides working with Ian. Were you, is that where you were going for from your theater well, experience? 
Yeah, I wanted I I wanted to be an actor, but I it wasn't like you weren't going out for auditions. You weren't trying to do that whole thing. No, I did. I I, I went on some auditions. I had an agent. I was you know did like a Comedy Central pilot thing that didn't go. I mm-hmm. you know did 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 some stuff, but it wasn't it wasn't big because I was I. I didn't have any money, so I had to like work, and then I'd have to like, you know, leave this shitty temp job to try to go make it across town to an audition, and then get back in time, and then get yelled at if I couldn't find parking quick enough, and get you know, it was, it was terrible. I hated it. So, um, so eventually, I, I decided, well, I should take a night job, so that I can have my days free to do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. And I, so um, shut up, wife. so i i took a i took a um, night job working as a logger on an mtv show um well that's that's also interesting how did you i mean no credentials you just walk can i can i do you you need any credentials to do that i don't even know what do you do when you're in your early 20s in la you're going to parties you're meeting people you know so i met a bunch i've met various people through my roommates and then through other friends that I had met, you know, and I, I made friends with a guy who worked in post on a reality show and he was like, Oh, I, you know, we were hiring night loggers, you know, and basically you would come in at night and you would watch hours and hours and hours, all the raw footage and you would write, you know, short descriptions of everything that was happening in the raw footage so that the writers during the day could then search through all that. They didn't have to watch hours and hours of raw footage. They could just do word searches and right. they could find things much more easily. Um, and I thought, well, this is great because I can do this at night and then during the day I can go on auditions and I can make short films and I can, you know, do all the things I want to do. And then when that was over, I, they asked if I wanted to do it again. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do another one for money because I like to eat. <laughs> and pay rent um and then as i was watching the raw footage i started to you know if i saw something really interesting i would would send an email to the to the writers the story producers that were working on the show and i'd say oh there's a really interesting moment with this character and this character that happens at this time and i think it could connect well with this other piece that i saw you know just because it was boring, it was a boring right, job, right. and well, I. Well, in your, your mind, you were it. connecting what you were actually watching. That this could this could be good. Yeah, or and did the this only piece way this I piece makes sense. Myself from you know right. dying of boredom, sitting in a room all night with headphones on, staring at a monitor, was to try and figure out like, oh, I wonder how they're going to make this into a show. And I started emailing them and saying like, check this moment out. I found this cool piece. And when I did that enough times, then one of the producers during the day said, hey, do you want to? Do you want to work, you know, in during the day and work as a story producer? You, <laughs> right. a, you know, a story AP, associate producer, which is like a an assistant. Um, well, that's a good lesson. Basically, you took the initiative. You didn't just sit there being a drone, and uh, someone noticed. So that's usually the stories I hear. Yeah. Well, the funny thing though is I didn't do it with any sort of. I didn't have any ambitions to be a producer or a writer or anything like that. I, I was still only doing it. To, so that I could basically put together a bankroll. Right. And then the idea was, oh, I'm going to take a bunch of time off and do my own stuff. And and then and to, to keep myself from going crazy because I was so bored, I was like, oh, well, how would this really work? How would I, how would I put this together? And I started... Hey, explain you know, the longer. Is this, is this an eight-hour at night job? Is this like a 10-hour yeah. at night job? How long, how long did you watch all this just raw footage? I think I think uh, I think the day started at like seven or eight o'clock at night, and then ended like three something like that, three right. in the morning. I mean, it was I, I it was a while ago, so I don't remember the exact hours, but right. it was it was a you know a night job, right? Um, right. And then you know, come home, get up at ten, do whatever you wanted to do, unless you had an, an early audition. So. Um, but then, yeah, though, so then once I started, once I got offered some, a few story producer jobs, I started working during the day and, and then, then, you know, then you're being offered more money and it's like, oh, wow, I can actually go out and have a drink with friends. I can <laughs> buy new shoes, you know, like, right. you know, <laughs> I, so I just started to enjoy I got a new pair of underwear. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, well, I'll just, you know, I still, I still 
worked on some projects with friends, but it just, this just sort of, and it was interesting in the beginning too, because it was like, you know, keep in mind, this is still when reality TV was still relatively new. So it was like, oh, this is cool. How do, how, how they put this together? It's kind of fun. Right. I didn't, still didn't have any sort of ambitions as, in terms of being a... Well, what year was this? Is this career. like the mid-90s? Well, what year is this? Like late 90s, early 2000s, you know. Oh, okay. Um, and then it just, it just went from there. I just kept doing that more and more. And then, and then I got offered a job in the field. So you're, you know, an AP in the field and you're running around with the cameramen and the field producers and you're assisting them. And, and it sort of just, so you, it's sort of, you, you fell into it almost by accident just cause you needed yep. some money. Yep. And then people noticed you, you actually were giving them good ideas and then they took you on and they said, well, here's more responsibility. Yeah, and just like everything else, I feel like, you know, if you're working on a show and you enjoy the people you're working with and, they, you know, they're smart, interesting, fun people and you get along with them, you know, they want to work with you again. So they right. invite you back or, you know, then, oh, you know, you get a call, someone who you worked with on one show who's now moved on to another show calls to see if you're available. And then before you know it, you've worked on a whole bunch of shows and you know a bunch of people and you, you know... It sort of perpetuates that way. Right. So I'm going to go into actually showing some of those shows because there was a bunch that you worked on that were, uh, I mean, big shows that everybody's heard of, I'm sure. Um, let's just, well, here, here you go. I'm sure. So, so Border Wars, um, Border Wars. A, a Nat Geo, there's Hotel Impossible, which uh, sort of blew up for travel, right? For the yeah. travel channel. Did Border Wars ever blow up? Is that, was that ever big? Yeah. Well, for a while, I mean, it was there, it was the, the, the biggest show on the on the channel for a while. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. Uh, we'll we'll pick a few to talk about. Obviously, the Bachelorette. Um, yeah. We talked briefly about that, but I'll I'll quickly show what that was about. Hold on a sec. Last season on The Bachelor. So good to finally meet you. <laughs> America watched as Jillian Harris fell in love with Jason Mesnick. When I came here to meet Jason, I was hopeful that I would find love. I'm going to give this rose to Jillian. Aww. He was just a very special guy. We just connected on so many levels. <laughs> okay, I've seen enough of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, what's funny is uh, season one of The Bachelor, I'll admit I watched it, but then I just, I just couldn't do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Just watched in a room alone, <laughs> naked. Just watched, yeah. Those guys are hot. Um, all right, Border Wars, which is, I will tell us a little bit about that. I'll play the trailer, but what is this about? Oh my gosh, Border Wars was great. Border Wars was, uh, well, Nick Stein was the showrunner, and he's just a great producer. And, um, you know, if you, if you sort of imagine National Geographic producer, what would that be? Uh, that's what this guy looks like, like a white beard and he's wearing like khaki pants and he's willing to sort of do anything and get into it. Um, and that was a great experience. We, it was a, basically a show about, you know, border patrol and customs and border protection and all those guys and sort of how they do their jobs, um, you know, all along the border everywhere, everywhere from like Florida to like all around Texas and Arizona and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, we just were sort of almost embedded with these guys. We would go and we would stay, you know, in like Brownsville, Texas, or we would stay in one of these small sort of border towns um, right near Mexico, and we'd be there for six weeks. And we would we would sort of go along with these Border Patrol agents every day on their, you know, just follow them through their daily routines. And then, and these are these are hotspots. So when something wild happened we would capture it we would shoot as much of it as possible right you actually saw you saw dead bodies did you see any gun fighting and things like that or yeah yeah crawled through a drug tunnel <laughs> okay <laughs> let, let, let me play the trailer we'll talk a bit more about that these officers and agents of the department of homeland security work around the clock protecting america's borders they're at ground zero in the war against narco trafficking illegal immigration and terrorism. I'm gonna get a pie and split up. In the next 12 hours, these federal officers in Nogales, Arizona, prevent a wanted man from slipping across the border. We never assume that he is just a not so bad bad guy. Uncover a shocking cartel smuggling strategy. They're both minors. One's 12 and one's 14. See the box? Hey! And break a port record for a single seizure. 
to stop something like that, it's, I mean, I'm still excited about it, you know? These are the border wars. Welcome to Nogales. Cool, so this was, uh, I mean, you, obviously drugs. Dr drugs, mostly guns. Drugs, guns, uh, human beings, you know. So what did you witness? What did you witness while shooting this? Obviously some sick shit, I'm sure. Well, we saw all sorts of stuff. I mean, it was, you know, that was exciting in a completely different way from The Bachelorette. I mean, that was like, you know, we were flying around on Black Hawk helicopters and we were going around with horse patrol through the desert in, in the middle of the night and riding on ATVs and, you know, finding drug tunnels that were being dug from Mexico into the U.S. and all this sort of craziness. Um, and... We we saw all sorts of stuff, and we, we were you ever in any the, were you were you ever in any danger while with these guys? Yeah, yeah, we had we were wearing bulletproof vests, and you know we there were times we heard gunfire. We think when we were in Laredo, uh, uh, Texas, there was Nuevo Laredo right across the river. We there you could hear grenades going off because there was like a, a cartel war that was happening, and you know there was there was uh, it definitely wasn't you know. Not dangerous. I mean, we were with our border patrol guys, so I sort of felt like it's different than if you just like have a backpack and a camera and you're wandering through an area like that by yourself or with a camera crew without protection. But when you're with a you know trained team of like border patrol guys, you like, feel we, safer, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't safe? I mean, those guys are in danger. So if you're with them, you're in danger. But um, I felt. I felt secure being with those guys. They were really good at what they did. And, the, you know, the guys that we were with were, were pros. And they put us with, you know, they put us with great guys because, you know, we're going to be on TV. These guys were vets. So um, they, we've, I, felt, I felt like we were in good hands. Right. We actually, me and you went on the hunt to Texas. Of course, yeah. we went with Border Patrol. You know, we were sort of just, uh, we had one former. Uh, retired. Yeah. Reti was he a Border Patrol person? Yep, he was a retired uh, border patrol person, and, and we also did have some security. One guy with a nice gun on him, right? <laughs> so, yeah. but uh, yeah. it w what was weird to me to go to because I've never been in those areas. This for me, you did you did four seasons of Border Wars, right, or five, something like that. Yeah, four. So that was the first time I was there. What was weird was like you know you hear about the fence in Mexico, right? Oh, look at this yeah. fence. They're building a fence. Uh, I'm sorry, from uh, uh, all across Texas to block out all the Mexicans from getting here. The fence, mm -hmm. I mean, the fence has so many holes, uh, literally there's a fence for like 300 feet and then there's no fence for two miles. You know, I don't think people understand that there's almost no fence. And now with Google Maps, you just could completely ignore the fence. <laughs> well, they, I mean, they, they try to be strategic about it. I think they put the fence up in areas where it was high traffic. Yeah, but you just, can go around it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like that's they, the point. But then when they put the fence up, they try to force traffic into areas that are easier for them to monitor. Uh, that's see. the idea. I got it. I got but it. But it's definitely not like it's just a, a big fence that goes all the way across without. I mean, it's, I, it's sections. It's little tiny sections. And then we literally drove around the fence. We went past the fence. We yeah, yeah we drove around the fence, and it's farmland. I was I was shocked. It's like just people are growing different. I don't know what they were growing exactly, but was it sugar cane? I don't know what was there. Something was there. Yeah, I don't remember. But basically. I didn't even realize it was farmland. And then you get to the Rio Grande, and the Rio Grande is like uh, like three feet across <laughs> where we were. Well, when <laughs> we were feet, there, let's was, be honest, you know, it's when feet. I was there on Border Wars, there was a there had been a huge, like all these storms that had come through, and there had been a ton of rainfall, and the and the river was completely, you know, overloaded. It was, and so that was the first time you know we really like saw a lot of dead bodies because there were people who would try to swim across and they would get caught in the current and drown. Right. Well, well when we were there, we were at like a small section. It was like 10 feet. I think we could walk across if we wanted. Yeah, when we, the section that you and I were at was, you could, you could wade across, you could, you know, pretty right. easily get through. Right, 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 right. I was just amazed just seeing it firsthand as opposed to just hearing all, you know, hearing the stories and seeing it was... Uh, yeah, finding gun sh uh, bullet shells. We did find bullet shells, right? That was cool. <laughs> and that's yeah. actually from uh, Border Patrol people shooting or just practicing, right? That's what the guy told us. 
just shooting their guns. Yeah, he was like, we don't know what this is from. Like, it might have been a guy just, you know, shooting in the river or something. I don't know. Right. It didn't have to be anything that negative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, we, did, we didn't find, like, a severed hand or something. <laughs> no, we didn't. No. I, I was scared. I'll admit we, it. But we did go through some, some areas where, like, you know, coyotes were doing some, some work and we yeah. got followed. We, we did get followed. That was a strange uh, episode where a guy followed us from one part of a shady area to another part of a shady area. Yeah, to, to, a, to a, a train yard at night. Right, right. And we did have a guy with us. This is, I'll tell my version of it. You can tell yours. But as soon as I saw the guy coming up that followed us and we all realized we were followed, I, uh, you know, I, after we informed Man. our security guy, I turned around like a little bitch and started walking the other way. <laughs> I'll admit that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're holding all the nice cameras. I'm though. holding the, yeah, I had to protect the cameras. It's really, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. I just pointed at you. <laughs> Take him. You're like him. He has all the footage. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, it was a iffy time, but uh, it, was, it was a good shoot nonetheless. We, yeah, we got some great stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. So let me go on to there was besides Border Wars, I think we had something else. Hotel Impossible, which is obviously way lighter. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And let's just show people what that's about, real quick. I'm Anthony Melchior. Outstanding hotels are my world. And after 20 years in the hotel business, there's no problem I can't fix. All around America, there are hotels that are hurting. They're understaffed, mismanaged, and in desperate need of a facelift. That's where I come in. I've turned around some of the most famous properties in America, from boutique hotels to big city landmarks. I'm on a mission, and I won't stop until every hotel you check into is perfect. I'm in La Jolla, California. Cool. So this is Hotel Impossible. You want to tell us a little bit about what this show is about? And... Yeah. Um, so I feel like Hotel Impossible is more in line with, what, with a lot of reality shows. It's a process show, you know? So you really just need a, you, you need a compelling character that you can build around. And Anthony uh, is, is that, you know? I mean, he's really distinct personality. And he, you know, he was a successful sort of hotel fixer, hotel consultant before you know, the show was ever made. So he had a successful business before the show. Um, and he's got a really strong personality and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't mess around. If he sees things that he doesn't like or that he knows needs to be fixed and they're not being fixed, he doesn't feel shy about telling people, which is really what you want if you're going to make a, you know, a reality show because that's what people get excited about is seeing, a lot of times seeing, you know, drama, conflict and all that kind of stuff. So, um, he basically goes all around the country, all around the world now, and he, and he finds hotels that, you know, maybe once upon a time were really, really nice hotels. That or sucks. Suck. Yeah, they, they suck. They, no, yeah, they, they suck. <laughs> but it has to be something be that can be fixed because, you know, otherwise he would just go to Motel 6 and, right. you know, he would go to some or some, some no-name hotel in the middle of the desert. It has to be something that has a redeeming quality about it. Something that he can do and, and actually help them out, obviously. Yeah, and then he'll... Uh, he'll I, I like that show, actually. I shot a little bit of it, just uh, the green screen stuff with Anthony. Oh, yeah, we, that's know, where we met for the first time. I, I think, think that is where we met, right. Yeah. Uh, and I actually like that show. I mean, I like... I like I'm going to admit it. I like some of these. <laughs> this is like candy for the brain. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just fun, you know? It's exactly. Fun. And not only that, but it's kind of interesting because everybody's stayed at a hotel... And everybody knows, you know, the basics, right? Like so, if you go into a hotel and you see, you know, crap on the bedspread, it's like, oh, that's disgusting. But, right, right. But there were, you know, doing a show with a hotel, like a talented hotel consultant as the, as the main talent, you know, part of the show is him sort of imparting that knowledge on the audience. Like, well, here's the thing. When you check into a hotel, like, what's the dirtiest thing in the hotel room? Oh, it's the remote control for the TV. You know, like. Right weird funky stuff like that so it was it was interesting it was fun and then and, he, and and then he you know identifies what's wrong with these places and and then he hopefully it, fixes it but what did you do on it exactly so i was a i was a story producer on that so basically they would go out and they would film everything and then send all the footage back to the office and then i would sit i would write the script and i would sit in the edit bay with the editor and edit the show so if there's a you know if this scene was a three-hour scene you know we have to cut that down to a two-minute you know, finished scene, a finished product. 
Right. So that's what I would do. We'd watch the raw footage and then whittle it down pass by pass until you have, you know, a minute and a half, two minute scene that still makes sense. that still goes somewhere. So that's still on TV, right? Hotel Impossible. Why did you, why did you end up leaving? Um, I left because uh, one of the producers in that office, uh, who you know, um, had gone to another company, <clears throat> and it was a company that um, that I had heard about, uh, ZPZ, that you know does all of Anthony Bourdain's stuff, and and I love uh, Parts Unknown, I love that show, um, and he you know was show running a, a, a new show at that production company and asked if I would come and work on it with him, and I just thought oh you know. They make great stuff over there. Like, I'd like to meet some more people in New York and, you know. Right, right, right. So you actually, you follow the producer because you want it to be, you, yeah. basically he's a talented guy and you wanted to stick by him. Yeah, I wanted to work with him again and it was right. work, it was a neat company that makes some cool stuff and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to sort of be a part of that family for a while. So I left and went to go work for this other company. Got it. And then. Can you go back if you wanted to? To Hotel oh, yeah, Impossible? I had a good, I had, I had a great relationship with them. They're really great. They were that was, I mean, I, I mean, I had fun working with you on the hunt. You know, we had a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had some good dinners. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, tell us. I mean, obviously, you've been doing uh, all the way. We got a back to we got back to story producing and back to producing. But you don't actually. That's not your goal, right? Your goal is to make films or make content, create content, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you know, I sort of feel like. Um, Working in nonfiction, working in reality, you're you're like a session player, you know, like a you know how back in the day, you know, a, a band's going to record an album, they would have session players come in and and play play along with tracks and stuff like that because a lot of times the band members, you know, were sort of like great in terms of touring and and that kind of stuff, but in the studio, they were less refined and couldn't do something right away in the time frame that was. Right. A lot you, of, <clears throat> right. You needed like, like some some great soloist to come in and just get that thing done. Yeah, you just like you're you're sort of all business. Like you come in and this is the meal that we want prepared, and you put it together, and then you move on to the next project. I sort of feel like that's how that's how nonfiction is a lot of times. Like you can have input in a specific story that you're telling. You know, if you're working on a specific episode or show, you can you can. As a producer, you can have input into creative decisions. And then ultimately, it's up to the showrunners and it's up to the network to say yes or no, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which is fine. But I, that, I still want to create my own, my own material. So, you know, that's really, that's the dream, right? Is to like have an idea, really put it together, craft it, and then sort of see it through into production and then... Here's, here's this finished project that you sort of were a part of from, you know, cradle to grave all the way through. Right. You know, like you talk to some people, <clears throat> you're in, I'm sorry, you talk to some people that have like uh, basically made it. So a lot of people would see, hey, you made it. You're actually producing TV content. You're doing great. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I assume you're making a decent living. I assume you can afford your, your shoes and your socks now, you know. They're all paid off. They're all, you paid it all off. You have an apartment, obviously. Yeah. No, no, so, this is not my car. So you totally, you know, like uh, from an outsider pers perspective, you made it. But obviously you want more. You want to do something else. And is that feature films? Oh, yeah. I mean, that would be, I mean, that's like, that would be amazing. That would absolutely be amazing. Yeah. I would love to do features. I would love to do... Well, well, well on which know. capacity? In which capacity? Producing features? Directing features? Like, what are you aiming for here? Yeah, I'd love to produce. I'd love to write and produce. Um, and I'd also love to direct, but I feel like, you know, I sort of feel like I, would, I need to do my own stuff before anyone's going to hire me to do theirs. You know what I mean? Right. When someone hires you to direct their project, that's their baby. That's, they're invested in that, and they don't just hand it over to anyone. And if they do then already you're, you have to be wary of it because it's like, who's going to hire an unproven director, you know? But if it's my own project, if it's something that I came up with, you know. So then what, I, what are you working to, to get to that goal? What are you doing? Well, right now I'm just writing. Right now I'm writing and, you know, you try to put together, a, you know, a, a nice bankroll so that if you need to take a couple months off, however long you need to take to work on a project, you can do it. Right. You know, right. the part the part that is... 
you know, odd or awkward for me would be like when you're ready to make something, you know, do you go out of pocket for it? I know when you're going to make a movie, if you write something like you find investors and that's something that I haven't ever done. And so I feel like that's an obstacle that eventually I'm going to have to overcome, you know, like I have to get over this fear of like, I feel like a panhandler, you know, when you're asking <laughs> people to invest in your project, it's sort of like, oh, it feels dirty to me. I know it shouldn't. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you give them, if you're asking for investors, they do get a percentage. They, they are taking a risk, of course, but they are getting something in return if it, if it does succeed, of course. Yeah. And uh, if it fails, you know, tough noogies, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Which is the name of my production company. <laughs> tough noogies. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a specific project that you have in mind, like that you're going to do next, that absolutely is going to happen, that you've written or anything like that? Yeah, well, I I have the one project. I don't want to give too much away because I don't want to like you know. You don't you don't want my three hundred listeners to steal it. <laughs> yeah, they're greedy bastards. Well, the two episodes ago it was like seven listeners, so now we're like up to three hundred. So you, I know they all have notepads out right now. So. <laughs> they all have notepads there. Everybody wants to hear what I have to say. <laughs> so 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 I mean, tell us what project is it? It's uh well it's a it's a project that it's it's basically tell us all. <laughs> It's born from uh, from some of it from personal experience. I uh, so I, I have a good friend in L.A. and he and I um, have you know worked on a bunch of stuff. We we worked on a a reality show pilot. We there's a family that we knew that are just really sort of amazing, fun, eccentric people, and and we knew them personally um, through friends. And we thought you'd be perfect for a show you, to have your own show. Um, they're sort of like the waspy Kardashians, you know, and, uh, we shot this whole, um, sort of sizzle reel, uh, with them and got a, we, we got it optioned and we shopped it around and there were a couple places that were interested, but it ultimately didn't end up being sold. And then he and I came up with a game show idea and, you know, put that all together and hired an artist to do some, some drawings of what the stage would look like and, worked on the gameplay and we pitched that we, we both had agents and we pitched that and we got that option by Fox 21 and then we went to all the big you know so all uh, this time see that's the thing like you weren't just doing the show uh, uh, the story producing you were actually doing your own content but in order to sell it you were trying to actually get it sold by selling. yeah 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 that's really the goal is really to, co- to create something and then you know produce it and see it being made and you know be a part of it that way I feel like that's that would be the most fulfilling, you know, because when you're working as a, you know, uh, as a as a producer on a reality show or a doc series or something like that, you're 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 a hired gun, you know what I mean? You right. You, you're brought in to do a very specific task, and then you do it, and then when the show's over, you go work on another show or you work on another season of that same show, and well, and that's great, you know, that's that's you know. Yeah, it's not the same. I, I you know, so I, I was just actually discussing this similar problem that uh, as a DP or as a producer or whatever, you can't split yourself in half. You can't split yourself in four. You can't multiply your effort across the board. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think when you do create your own content, that's multiplying your effort because it's at some point working on its own, hopefully selling on its own. Yeah. Being bought at VOD or streaming on TV or um, exactly. streaming streaming on Netflix or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's the way to multiply what what we do by by creating our own stuff. I think that's the only way, actually. So I agree with you there, hundred percent. Yeah, and for me, you know, even in the meantime, if I'm not if I'm not working on a pitch that I'm going to try to sell, you know, there are still things that I'll shoot just for fun, you know, just literally just for the joy of doing something silly and stupid and fun, like the the short uh, series that I did, the Live in the Dream, the one I sent you before. Well, I, I'll bring that up since you mentioned it real quick. Yeah. Just to the part where you have a funny mustache, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then people can check it out. Every, every every link will be on my site, of course, of what we've discussed. And, you, you know. The benefit of the doubt. But, oh, hold on. It sounds like. So this is the, the, the short. There's a couple of six episodes, you said? Yeah, five or six. Okay. We'll see how it goes. It sounds like you're under a great deal of pressure right now. So I'm going to give you the benefit mm. of the doubt. Was actually uh, trolling around Craigslist. You know what I'm saying? And I uh, saw you. an ad for a uh, boom operator. That facial hair is real. And it said free snacks and uh, lunch. That's really all I needed to hear, brother. <laughs> no, we're not coming to your place to interview you. 
I think that's I, I didn't see the whole thing, but that's probably the funniest part of the <laughs> It might be. It might be. I love that porn stash or whatever that's Oh yeah. That's I had the full on handlebars. <laughs> right. I didn't know you can grow a mustache. Oh, I can. <laughs> I've never seen it. So yeah, I agree with you once again, you gotta create your own stuff. Was that was that something you did with a, bu- a couple of buddies here in LA? I'm sorry, here in New York and then No, that was in LA. That was before right. I moved to New York and I that that was actually You look young. Two guys, um, uh, Paul Stork and Billy Grant, two guys who were who were you know reality TV show producers like like uh, like me and like uh, my friend Alistair, um, who was who was uh, playing that other character that you just watched, um, and we it was just a weekend and we he, he, they had a funny idea let's shoot this idea, and it was supposed to be, you know, doc style like The Office but behind the scenes on a low budget independent movie right. where like every week the script is being changed. Oh, we've made script revisions. Now it's in space. You know, like every <laughs> week it would just change. And the actor was getting flustered because his lines kept getting changed and he didn't know what was going on. And he has to deal with an asshole sound guy. <laughs> and I was, so he was the actor and I was the sound guy and we have like this sort of, you know, got it. This is back and forth. I'll, I'll yeah. watch it. I'll watch it today. Um, it was fun. All right. So uh, so what is the name of the show that you're going to – you're not going to tell us the name of the show that you were trying to make, the other show that you were discussing? Showrunners is the name of it. And it's basically – so we we basically – this is how – was, I was super green, but we went and pitched this game show, my buddy Alistair and I. Uh, we pitched this game show and we – you know, it was being pitched at Fox and we went to ABC and we pitched it, you know, in the boardroom to the ABC execs. And when we left this – these they were like, oh, this is great. We really love it. You know, and when we were driving home – uh, we both lived in the same apartment complex, uh, my buddy and I. And so we were driving back to our apartment building, and I was like, you know. We're going to be millionaires. Made. We're going to be rich. We're going to be rich. <laughs> you know, we're going to sell a show. This is going to be amazing. How, how did you, I mean, this is interesting too. How did you get those meetings even? Was it your agents that set up with, with Fox and all those other people? No, that one was actually there. Uh, there were There was a production company, and the people who owned the production company you know, we had known and, and had worked with before and had had a good relationship with them. And then we had this idea and we called them and said, hey, we, you know, we have this idea for a show. You know, can we pitch it to you? Would you like to hear it? And they, you know, they they had become friends of ours. And so they were like, yeah, come by, you know, pitch it. So we, we pitched the idea to them. They liked it. They had a first look deal with Fox 21. And so we went and we pitched it to Fox 21 and then Fox 21 optioned it. And, you know, it was so we I at that time I thought, this is this is it. Like we're set. It right. ended up not. So it ended up not being sold. They ended up not buying it. Um, but then you know I would turn on the TV and I would see a game show and it was like if you guess the wrong answer, all your prizes get thrown off the roof of this building, or something ridiculous. And I, it was like how how does this shit get made? You know <laughs> how 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 does this? There should you know. There's uh, there's a, there's actually a podcast called How Did This Get Made with Paul Shear who. It's about movies mm-hmm. and they talk about ridiculous movies and right. wonder, like, they dissect them. How did this crappy movie get made? Like, I feel like there should be something similar for how did, TV how shows. How did this but... terrible game show get made? Yes. <laughs> um, but I was so frustrated seeing, like, something that I thought was just sort of like a cheap idea that, that I know just, you know, I mean, somebody who had done a ton of shows pitched a show and it got sold and it got put on TV. So I... Just started writing down every horrible, shitty reality show idea I could think of. I was like, when I when I get, you know, if I ever have a career where like I'm, I have enough sort of like capital that I can get whatever shows I want made. Like here are the worst shows. Like I'm just gonna start churning out crap, you know, and just seeing if people will buy it. Any crappy idea I have. So I, I wrote down a bunch of these terrible reality show ideas, and then I thought, I've worked on so many you know, reality shows. And I know what it's like behind the scenes on a, on a reality show. So I just started to work on a project about, you know, about that world. And wait, so, so what are you doing next about the family or about reality shows? What do you mean? My own project? Yeah. You talked about two, right? There's one with, uh, Oh, so the, the waspy family, family. Well, the family one ended up not going, and then and then they had their own sort of changes in their personal life, you know, like, uh, the, so you've given that up. You've given that up. Yeah, they've moved. I mean, like this person now got married, and then this got person it, got, got divorced, and they've yeah. all sort of 
they yeah, well, have different it, lives. So the it, show that we right. originally pitched it wouldn't exist. It would be a different show. But got it, got it. Yeah. And we do have something that we're discussing, but we'll save that for another time. Yeah, we have a pretty interesting <laughs> idea. Yeah, no one should know that just yet. <laughs> you don't want to give that one up. <laughs> that one's good. <laughs> <laughs> Not this other crap I just talked about. <laughs> Not this other. Anyone could steal the last 10 minutes of whatever John said. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, John. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Good talking with you. All right. Later. So next week, we're going to interview Richard LeMay, and he's a director of multiple films that have been sold. And uh, his last movie is a horror movie, which we're going to discuss. Don't forget, you could email us at info at photographyofdirector.com if you have any show ideas or would even want to be on the show. Please let us know.